go through the announcements as quick as we can uh, to get on to that worship. Um, certainly want to welcome everyone here today if you're visiting with us. Especially want to make you feel home. So welcome here. If you do not have a church home, I would like to invite you to make Hebrew Christian your church home and uh, serve Jesus and uh, worship the Lord here uh, from week to week. Uh, Sunday school, we have Sunday school classes for all ages. I just encourage all to come to those uh, various classes and small group meetings. It's a wonderful time of uh, Christian uh, friendship as well as study. Uh, youth meetings tonight at 6.30 along with the evening worship service. Just encourage all the young people to come back uh, for evening uh, youth meetings and uh, the parents and others come for worship. Uh, 200th anniversary committee meeting. If you're on that committee, please take note that we will be meeting on May 6th at 7 o'clock. Uh, if anybody else would like to be a part of that, come and help us in, in some form or fashion. You're certainly welcome to be a part of that as well. Wednesday Bible study in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, studying who is the Holy Spirit. Vacation Bible School. Uh, first week, full week of June, June 3rd through the 7th. Uh, 6.15, 8.30 or so nightly. Uh, be praying for that. If you haven't volunteered yet, sign up in some form or fashion. Please do that. We, we need the whole church involved and in teaching these young people about Jesus. Uh, be praying for that. Along with that, uh, the safety committee would like to ask for volunteers to help with, uh, during the week of VBS, to pair the kids up. We're going to give them bracelets and match kids and parents or guardians or whatever. So we're going to have to match them up afterwards uh, before they leave. We need a lot, of, a lot of help to get that done as quickly as we can. Uh, we will have a work day this Saturday uh, to work on the building across the street, get it ready uh, for putting and uh, installing the door, uh, for uh, putting the trailer in there. That will start at 8 o'clock this Saturday morning. Um, monetary gifts towards the VBS snacks, give them to Ellen Hawking, and she will see that they are uh, used to purchase those. Uh, 200th anniversary t-shirt, remember that 200th anniversary is the last Sunday of August the 25th of this year. Got a lot of things planned. Uh, if you'd like to have one of the t-shirts, they're in the walkway. You can sign up for uh, one of those over there. Volunteers for Oil Belt Camp to help cook that one day. Uh, talk to Jerry Hawking. He will get you involved in that. The summer Lunch Wagon Ministry. Sabrina is going... I'm, I'm here. Where's I'm right here. Back there. I just really need... If you, feel, if you have signed up to help, please fill out the background check form so I can get a turn back into her. The deadline is like the 24th. Um, and then if there's calendars back there, please commit to a day. You know, one day, you know, it's 10 weeks, 30 minutes, 12.30 to 1. Um, I just need some people just to commit to a certain day, please. If you're trying to help, I really appreciate it. Just get with me. You know, the calendars are back around the table. Um, Okay, we really need people to sign up for yeah. that. You know, I mean, we had that initial sheet, and there was uh, about 30 people signed up to be a part of that. Uh, but on the calendar back there, there's only like three people that have signed up so far. So we really need to get to, committed to that so we know that we've got people to cover each day. I mean, um, at least two a day. Yeah. You know, three three is good, but at least two for sure, you know. Um, so yeah. however many days you want to work, we, we do need to commit to that. Okay? Um, also, Styrofoam uh, plate collection, uh, there are, uh, there's two brochures back there on the, on the glass case, one for Oil Belt, and, or Oblong Christian Church, Children's Home, excuse me, and one for Camp Liliana. Until you put them on, put those in the, in the walkway, and we will get those to those appropriate missions. Uh, the mission team is still looking for uh, anybody and uh, opportunities to serve, so uh, get those applications if you would. Uh, Fellowship Hall has been reserved for May 19th. And the 200th anniversary, uh, remember, is again on August 25th. Uh, looking forward to some uh, some wonderful times that day. Um, we've got a couple of music groups going to be here, and uh, past preachers, uh, at least four of them, have committed to come and uh, be a part of that. So it's going to be a wonderful time. Any other announcements? All right, on to the prayer list then. Um, from both the men's and women's Sunday school classes, uh, we're adding Lynn's wife. She has uh, cancer from the esophagus. Uh, Terry Graham, uh, his uh, cancer has returned. Cameron Hammond, uh, having a baby tomorrow, the Mockabee's granddaughter. Uh, Myrna Hussey, uh, something going on with her hand and her thumb. So keep them in your prayers. Anyone else to add to our prayer list? Jackson Malcolm. Jackson Malcolm. Okay. okay, anyone else? All right, 
on to the birthday list then. Uh, happy anniversary, or happy birthday, excuse me, to Greta Hawking, May 5th, uh, to Alyssa Hawking, uh, May 6th, uh, Lola Metter, uh, May 6th, Andrea Venus, May 7th, and uh, uh, Olivia Peach on May 9th. Uh, also, a happy anniversary to Tony and Lori Abel on May 6th, and uh, Roger and Sherry uh, Keefer, May 9th. Any birthdays or anniversaries, not the bulletin? All right. Uh, we do have VBS. I think I skipped that myself. VBS music practice tonight, and anybody's welcome to come. Hello. 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 <coughs> and I'd like to personally say thank you to all that came um, the other night when we had a VBS workshop, and we got a lot of work done. I appreciate everyone coming and helping us. Out. We're getting ready. It's almost there. It's less than a month. This is what? The fifth. And it starts the third of June. So pray for us, please. Yeah. Let's stand and sing, Lord. Lift your name on high.
No, if not, we'll be singing our praise hymn, Your Everlasting Love. And let's stand for that. Good old BBS song. <laughs> darkness 
and has brought us into the kingdom of His Son, whom He loves, Christ Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Father in heaven, again, as we come into your house this morning, Lord, we thank you for the blessings of life, for the creation around us, for all that you've given us here on this earth. And Father, especially for this time that we have, you can get your son's table again, to remember the sacrifice, the suffering, the pain, and all we went through for many long hours, so that we might be free of sin. Father, we are so thankful. Break this bread and take the cup this morning, Lord, uh, realizing what it does represent. Father, uh, we ask that you this morning that you be each one here, that uh, your presence is, is felt in all of our lives, that we uh, look at this time as a time to reflect on Christ and his example of a, a sinless life, a life of uh, service, and Father, just a life of love and forgiveness. We pray, Father, now that as we enter a new week, that we reach out to those that uh, need to hear the support about Christ, His love and forgiveness, and that we are uh, more bold in our faith. And that all these things we ask in Christ's name. Father, we do thank you for this Lord's Day of the Sunshine and this day and this opportunity we have that we can gather together in your house and sing praises to you. Bless the word that we may. Take it into our lives that we can live the way you want us to live and to tell others about you today. How important it is to be in our lives. We thank you for this time which we do get around your table in the name of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, who came to the earth and found the whole world in the world. I want to make Each one here realizes what he did for us by dying such a horrible death for us, but only to raise again as we can. Blood that was shared for us. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for our blessings that we receive from you each and every day. And that we need to keep in mind that you are with us at all times, no matter what comes before us.
a right relationship with God would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. That we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons or daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The church in Galatia to which this letter is written, this part of scripture, was written to a real live, honest to goodness church in the Roman province of Asia Minor. Now, that was in modern-day Turkey. So just imagine in your mind, you know, that picture of Turkey is basically looked like a loaf of bread. And if you can imagine the upper northern part of it, on the uh, east side of it, would be where the region of Galatia was. And it was a Roman province. Which meant that it was under Roman law. All of the laws of the Roman Empire applied to every man, woman, and child living in the region of Galatia, including all of the, the dear saints that are in the church at Galatia. And I want you to understand something, that the Roman law of the time was brutal. It was barbaric. If there was an uprising somewhere in the empire, it would be squashed as quickly and as brutally as possible to discourage other people from wanting to do the same thing. It was a law that was governing the entire world, and for the most part, it brought peace and prosperity to the known civilized world. But if there was any breach of that law, retribution was terrible. Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of, uh, of Judea and resided in Jerusalem and ruled over that part of, of the world in the life and history of the, the, the apostles and Jesus, I understand that Pontius Pilate who let Je wanted to let Jesus go but ultimately gave in to political peer pressure and crucified Jesus, I understand that he was one of the most wicked people on the planet. There were times when he would just send his troops out to slaughter people. There was one time he killed over 3,000 Jews in an uprising in Jerusalem. He was barbaric. So was Roman law. And so the Galatian Christians, here's the point of that, the Galatian Christians are fully aware of law. And the Jewish Christians in Galatia were doubly aware of what law was all about. Because not only did they live under Roman law, but they also were governed by Old Testament Mosaic law. The law of God, the Old Testament scriptures, the Ten Commandments, and everything else that was built upon those ten and governed the life of any Jewish person, the Galatian Jewish Christians understood law. But they didn't understand its purpose. They didn't really understand why it was given to them, why they had to follow it, why it was such a part of the world. And so we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the purpose of the law, the promises of God, and the purpose of faith. Let's look, first of all, at the purpose of God's law. Look at verse 19. He asks the question as he begins this whole section. He says in verse 19, what then was the purpose of the law? Good question. Our legislators make laws and pass laws all the time 
There are thousands and thousands of laws in America, and there's always a purpose behind it. There's a reason for it. And so it is with God's law. And I want you to look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, For if a law could, excuse me, it was added because of transgressions until the seed, the word seed refers to Jesus, until Jesus, to whom the promise referred, had come. The law was put in effect by angels through a mediator. So one of the partial answers to the question, what is the purpose of the law? It was given to us because of transgressions or sin until Jesus came. The Bible uses several different words to refer to sin. One of them is transgressions. And you really need to know that. Okay? The word transgressions is made up of the word trans which means across, and gression, which means to aggressively cross something. And so a transgression is where you cross the line of God's law. When God said, don't do this or do this, and you cross the line, and you transgress the law, and you break it, that in itself is a great definition of sin. So a transgression is any thought or action that crosses or goes against God's law. Anything a person does to cross the line and break one of his laws. For example, you know, in the creation, God said to Adam and Eve, He said, don't eat of this one tree. So leave it alone. You got the whole world. Leave this one alone. And of course, you know, they ate from that one tree. And they transgressed. They broke the one law that God had given at that point in creation. At that point in the history of the world, there was one law. And they broke it. And so they transgressed. They sinned. And then they brought sin into our world. Romans 4.15 says this. Because the law brings God's wrath against sin. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. And so the purpose of the law was to make us aware of transgressions, to make us aware of sin. That's one of the great purposes of the law, is it's added because of sin, and we need to know that we are sinners. For example, if you're driving, you have to stop at stop signs, right? Oh, please agree with me on that. <laughs> you're going to have some trouble here pretty soon if you don't. If you don't stop, then you run through a stop sign, which is wrong. Correct? Why is it wrong? Because there's a law that says you can stop at stop signs. If there wasn't a law that said that, help me out here. Think this through. If there was not a law that said you had to stop at stop signs, but there were stop signs all over the place, what could you do? You could just drive past them, and would you be doing anything wrong? No. no. Why? Because there's no law. And so the law was given so that we could see ourselves for what we really are and our need. That I need a Savior. There's something wrong with me that I can't fix. There's something wrong with you that you can't fix. My mom can't fix it. My grandma can't fix it. My wife can't fix it. Nobody can but Jesus. And so the purpose of the law was to point out sin, to make us aware of sin so that we would see our need for the Savior. So transgressions or sins are only transgressions and sins because there's a law from God that says that it is. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is law sin? Almost sounds like law is sin then, right? The law is not sin. The law just points out what is sin. Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For example, in the scripture itself, for I would not have known what coveting was by the way, please tell me you know which one of the ten that is. Somebody shout it out. One of the ten commandments. Thou shalt not covet. Which one is it? It's the tenth one. It's the last one. Okay, study up on those. All right? <laughs> I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not yet. But look at them now. <laughs> Listen to this. This is, this is tough stuff. I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. 
The thought would never have occurred to me that that coveting was wrong. Had there not been a law that says, do not covet. Now there is, I have to know what that is, right? I have to figure out what that is. I have to know what that is so that I don't do it. Because if I do it, then I sin. And if I continue to sin, then I'll be lost. Verse 19, back to our main text, Colossians chapter 3, back to Colossians 3, 19. The seed, meaning Jesus, to whom the promise referred had come. Verse 21, is the law there opposed to the promises of God? It sounds like the law then is this bad thing, and it's not. The law actually points out the need for a Savior, which is one of the great promises of God. Verse 21, for if the law had been given to impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the law can't save you. The purpose of the law is not to save you. The purpose of the law is to point out your sin, your flaws, and your need for a Savior. To point you to Jesus. The law cannot save because you can't keep them all. If you go back earlier in the book of Galatians and you read through that, if you are going to be saved by the law, you have to keep all of it perfectly. And nobody can do that except Jesus. No one can keep the law of God perfectly except the Lord Jesus. Verse 22, Galatians 3.22, But the scriptures declare that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. Sin controls people's lives, doesn't it? Sin, the trio used to sing a song, Sin will take you farther than you <coughs> intend to go. Remember we were years ago at a, at a revival service and the guy was preaching about, uh, about lying. And uh, they called a little boy up and he said, I forget the whole, the exact thing, but he said something about doing a little, little fib sin. You remember that, Gordon? Little, little white lie. You tell a little white lie and you've got to cover it up with another lie. And then you've got to cover that one up with another lie. And the next thing you know, it's a big old mess. And it's controlling you. Because if somebody finds out, sin controls. Everybody is a slave of something or someone. Everybody. The question simply is which or what or who. So not only is all of sinful mankind a spiritual prisoner of the law, but it also controls all of their lives. That's why the world outside of the body of Christ, outside the church, is so messed up. Sin is controlling the entire planet. Romans 6.16 Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? If you come up to a person and you say, okay, I'm going to be your slave, then you're now obligated to do whatever they tell you to do, right? That's not real hard to understand. But he goes on to say, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, spiritual death, hell, or obedience, slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Choice is yours. Romans 8, 7 and 8, the sinful mind is hostile to God. People who are not saved, who are not in Jesus Christ and filled with the Spirit of God, they're hostile to God. That's why the world hates Jesus and hates Christianity so much. And they wanted to get him out of get Christ and Christianity out of the schools and out of the workplace and out of the public eye. They just want him to go away. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Verse 23, Galatians 3.23, before this faith came, we'll get to that here in a moment, we're still on the first point. Before the faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, spiritually speaking. And a lot of people are not only spiritually prisoners of the law and, and their lives controlled by sin, but they are addicts and all kinds of things. It physically controls them, it mentally and emotionally controls people in a lot of different ways as well. The law of God makes spiritual prisoners of everyone who breaks it. That is, everyone who sins, which of course is everything. Verse 23, we are locked up, spiritually locked up by the law. Until the faith should be revealed. We'll get to that in a minute. Verse 24, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. You see that? 
Please, everybody, see that. <coughs> the purpose of the law is to point out sin and to lead us to Jesus. Because once you see the, you look at the law and you see that you're a sinner, then you obviously need a savior. <coughs> the whole point of this. If you're thinking this sermon's not about Jesus, you're wrong. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The law of God, the Old Testament law, is to point us to Jesus, to show us that we have a, a sin problem in our lives and we need someone to save us. We need somebody to rescue us, to show us that we, we, we are powerless, we are, we are slaves to, to sin, and we need to be freed from it. And the only one that can do that is Jesus. He's the only one who has done all that God requires in His law to rescue and redeem us from sin and from the law and its consequences. Verse 25, we're almost done with this first point. Now the faith has come, we'll get to that, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. And I want you to understand that. If you're here today and you're a Christian, a child of God, you are not under the supervision of the law. You don't have to keep all of the Old Testament laws and rules and regulations. And there are hundreds of them. Including dietary laws and sacrificial laws. Not just the Ten Commandments. He's talking about the whole Old Testament. All of those things were so, so spiritually crushing. You don't understand how horrible it was to live under the old covenant. Literally, if you sin, every time you sin, you should run to, to Jerusalem, to the temple, not for sacrifice. Every single time. Do you realize that? How many of you would be there with me all the time? Some of you are lying in you know what. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you would. You know what I'm saying? I would be there all the time. And see, without law, people just do what they want to do. It would be a world of complete lawlessness and chaos. Anarchy. like human relativism, which saturates our culture. Well, that may be good for you, but it's not. It's not my thing. Well, that's fine. What if somebody's thing is to kill people? <coughs> Have you ever thought about how absurd that whole relativism thing is? There's no, there's no absolute truth. Well, what if somebody felt like they just wanted to go around killing people? Anybody here be okay with that? You think people who are not Christians out there in the world would be okay with that? No. But what would their basis be for that? If they reject the law of God, what is the moral basis for believing that that's wrong then? You see, that's what the law is for. It shows what's right and wrong, what sin is. Shows that we have a need, point us to Jesus, who is the answer to the need. The Savior. Because without law, it would be a world of lawlessness and out of chaos. <coughs> Let me summarize this point real quick, and I'm going to move on to the second. The law is to point out our sin. It shows our need for a Savior. It restrains people from sinning and just doing what they want, and ultimately leads people to Jesus Christ. What it can't do is it cannot, it cannot impart spiritual eternal life. And it can't save you from sin. So personally, you need to realize this. You need to be completely all over this. Understand that you're a sinner and you're in need of a Savior. If you're here today and you're a Christian, you've already got the Savior, but you need to stay with Him, right? Missionally, there are people out there that have no clue what I just talked about in that first point. There are some people in your family that don't know Jesus. There are people you work with, you go to school with, they don't know Jesus. And they're caught up in this culture of, of relativism. And they need to be pointed to Jesus because they have a need just like you and I. They're sinners just like you and I, and they need a Savior. And if we don't tell them, how will they ever know? Second point. That's the purpose of law. And caught up in all of that are the promises of God. I'm excited about this. Promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. Go to Him. And we don't sing it as often as I'd like to sing it. That's not a criticism. That's just a statement of fact. I love that old song, Stand Up, Stand Up, on the promises of God. 2 Peter 1.4 says this, Through these, 
meaning Scripture, the Word of God, Bible. God has given us His very great and precious promises. Somebody name one. Everlasting life. Oh, there's a couple more. <laughs> okay. How about a Savior? Kind of goes with the message? No. There's going to be a Savior. I'm going to send you a Savior, and He'll save you from your sins. I just read in Colossians. Did you catch that when I read in Colossians for communion? He sent us Jesus, who has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light of His Son, Jesus. We have so many great promises. Look at this passage. I just want you to catch this real quick. This passage that I just read is saturated with references to the promises of God. Hang on. Verse, verse 16. It says the promises. Verse 17. The promise. Verse 18. A promise. Verse 21. The promises of God. Verse 22. What was promised? Verse 29. According to His promise. He's talking about the law and the promises of God. And then we're going to get a slide here in just a moment into faith. The promises of God. Where would we be without all the great and precious promises of God? Verse 22. The scriptures declare that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised meaning a Savior and eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and all of those great spiritual promises of God being given through who? Jesus Christ. Being given through faith in Christ Jesus. We're not under the law. We don't have to keep all of the rules and regulations of the law. We cannot be saved by the law, but we can be saved by the promises of God through Jesus Christ. Verse 23, before this faith came, until faith should be revealed, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, and over and over it talks about faith in Jesus. Coming to know God through Christ, our Lord and Savior. His sacrifice, His, His redemptive act on the cross of Calvary, in which He has saved each and every one of us. The purpose of faith in Jesus is to bring us eternal life, to rescue and redeem us from the law and its curse and its punishment, the wrath of God, and everything else that is behind that. By the way, I'm on the third point. Okay, I didn't, sometimes you just let the Holy Spirit do what you need to do. Verse 24, I want you to look at this verse in particular, that we might be justified by faith. The word justified means that we, when we accept Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ is applied to our lives and He washes away our sins, we are now justified. We are saved, we are redeemed. There's a whole bunch of different words for basically the same thing. One of them is justified. Justified from the law. It's like going before a judge or a justice of the peace and being put on trial. And de being declared innocent and being set free. Justified means that we are looked at by God when He looks down from His throne in heaven and He looks at Alan Wright. He doesn't see Alan Wright's sins. He sees the blood of Jesus and He looks at me just as if I had never sinned. Now you don't. And other people on the planet that maybe I've offended or something in some form, you know, sometimes they don't forgive. But God always does. And you might look at me and you might remember something that you don't particularly like that I said or did or, or something else about me. But when God looks at me, He sees the blood of Jesus. He doesn't see my sin. He looks at me just as if I had never, ever, 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 ever done anything wrong. As if I was, in fact, perfect. Because through Jesus... I am. He doesn't see a lawbreaker anymore. He doesn't see a sinner. He doesn't see a soul stained with sin. But he looks at me and he sees a saint. And he sees a soul that's covered and cleansed and clothed with Jesus. It says, those of you who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. It's like, you know, I put this coat on to come preach. It's like putting on Jesus when you're saved. Verse 25, now the faith has come. And it's here. Through Jesus. Through his death, burial, and resurrection. Now that faith is here, verse 26 and 27, you are all sons or daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 
How are you a son or daughter of God? By faith. And who? Remember when I was growing up, Christian Church in Crafton, and I think about that church a lot, it's, it's a wonderful church. It really was. Small church in the middle of, of one of the boroughs of, of, of Pittsburgh. We always got little attendance pits. Yeah. Anybody old enough to remember those little attendance pits in your life? If you would go to Sunday school or church and you not miss, and back in those days you couldn't bring a you know, doctor book or something. You really you couldn't miss. After like a year, you get a little pin. I remember a little round pin, you put it on your on your shirt or whatever, wear that. And then after you got another year, there's a little thing you could hang on the bottom of that. And then if you got another year, you can hang another one under that. And then, you know, some people had, you know, you can win all the attendance pins in the world. And they won't say it. Now, you should be in church to worship God and Jesus. But coming to church in and of itself doesn't score you any points with God for salvation. You should read your Bible every single day. You should pray every day. That doesn't score you points with God in terms of salvation. You should witness to your neighbors about Jesus Christ, but that doesn't score any points with you in God in heaven concerning your salvation. Your salvation is completely bought and paid for by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and it's all by faith in what he did. This is a little subtle difference between being saved by you know, James says faith without works is dead. It's, a, it's, like, it's like splitting hairs. If you're saved, you serve. You ever heard anybody say that before? <laughs> and if you claim to be saved and you don't serve, then I have to have a question mark about it. You claim to be saved. <laughs> because people who are saved serve. You don't serve to be saved. But if you're saved, you serve. Think that one through for a minute. Because it's all by faith in the work of Christ, the finished work of Jesus on Calvary. Remember when he's hanging on the cross, seven things Jesus said. The last thing he said was, it is what's finished. The work God sent him to do, which was to die shed his precious blood for all of my transgressions, all of yours, and the sins of everybody else and the whole world of all ages. So personally, I ask you, how's your faith? How's your faith? Do you realize that the law points out your flaws and your need? Yeah. Have you seen that you need a Savior? Has it led you, does it point you even still after you're being saved? Does it lead you continually back to Jesus when you see how often you still break the law? It should. But do you see how encouraging and how glorious the great promises of God, one of which is eternal life in heaven, the forgiveness of sins, and, and the hope of glory because not of what you've done, but of what Jesus has done. And has it driven you to deeper and deeper faith in Christ? Deeper and deeper commitment to Jesus. And to reach out to other people who are lost and bound eternally for hell because they don't know Christ until you and I speak up a word for Jesus. You ever ask yourself what the purpose of the law is? It's to simply point out sin and point out the need in your life that you need to save. It cannot save. But Jesus does. And because Jesus died, was buried, and raised, we have the great promises of God, and through faith in Him, one day we will enjoy that for our eternity. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you've never accepted Christ, never been immersed into Jesus Christ, baptized in the water and the, and the Spirit. That's what Scripture says. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. He said, I'm telling you, guy, unless you're born again, you can't get to heaven. Nicodemus said, I don't know what that is. Jesus said, you've got to be born with water and the Spirit. Stand before others and confess your faith in Jesus. 
that you believe that he is the Christ, the promised Savior, the Son of the living God, that he died, was buried, and raised for your sins. There's so much more to know. I understand that. But that's all you need to know to be saved. Stand before the congregation, confess your faith in Jesus, accept him as Lord, and be immersed into Jesus Christ. Have your sins washed away. And God will look at you just as if you never sinned. Let's stand and sing. Jesus' name.